How many of you enjoy a good love story? Anybody? Anybody? Any rom-com fans worshiping this morning? All right, I see some people. I see a couple of hands. Well, what if I told you, what if I told you that the Bible is a love story? A love story from beginning all the way to the end. Would you believe me? Because it's true. It's true, the Bible is a love story. In one sense, the, the, the Bible could be described as this love story where God is choosing, where God is gathering, where God is preparing a bride for his son. As a matter of fact, if you had to simplify the Bible story into like one or two sentences, that's one of the ways you could describe it. A story, a love story where God is preparing a bride for his son. Well, this is what we're going to talk about in the lesson this morning. Uh, We're going to talk about marriage in the Bible, marriage from beginning to the end. Because marriage in the Bible is is one of the biggest themes that we see in Scripture. It's one of the most important themes that we see in this in Scripture. And this theme uh, begins in the book of Genesis. And it flows all the way through to the book of Revelation. And there's a reason behind this. I believe that God wants us to see something about marriage. I believe that God wants us to see and understand that our marriages are pointing to something greater. So that's what we're going to talk about in the lesson this morning, marriage from beginning to end. And what we're going to do is we're just going to take a journey through scripture. Uh, We're going to do sort of this high level overview, this high level picture of scripture. We're going to start in the book of Genesis. We're going to end in the book of Revelation. And we're going to look at marriage as it pops up in the Bible story. And we're going to learn what our marriage is pointing to. Uh, I was telling Jarvis before the lesson began, I was telling Jarvis that I was really nervous about this lesson, probably more nervous than I'd been about any lesson that I've done in the past couple of months. And it's just because I'm doing it so differently. You know, usually I give you guys three nice, neat points and they're, they're kind of well packaged. I'm not going to do that in this lesson per se. We're just going to take a journey through scripture. We're going to take a journey through scripture and we're going to uh, take a look. We're going to make certain stops at where marriage sort of rears its head. So we're, we're going to talk about marriage from beginning to end and we're going to start in the beginning, right? We're going to start in the book of Genesis, the first couple of chapters in Genesis, and we're going to take a look at the first marriage. We're going to take a look at the first bride, the original bride, that is Eve. And so we start in the beginning where where Adam is in the garden and he is alone in the garden. And he's got a lot of responsibilities in the garden. As a matter of fact, in Genesis chapter two, if you're there, in verse 15, we see some of Adam's responsibilities. The Lord God took man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So uh, Adam had some responsibilities here in the garden. He was to work and to keep it. He was to rule over the garden, rule over the earth righteously. And this was a big task. It was a huge task. And God looks at this situation and he says, it's not good for Adam to do this alone. It's not good for Adam to be alone. And so we see in verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone, so I will make a helper fit for him. You know, sometimes we look at this text and we think to ourselves, oh, you know, Adam was, Adam was lonely. Adam was lonely and he needed a companion. But notice with me that the text doesn't say that Adam was lonely. The text says that Adam was alone But the text doesn't say that Adam was lonely because if Adam was lonely, God would have created a companion for him. But that's not what God created for him. What does the text say? Eve was a helper. Eve was a helper. So here we see sort of the original purpose of marriage. The original purpose of marriage is not necessarily companionship. The original purpose of marriage, especially for for, for Adam and Eve, was they were to help one another fulfill God's will. And that's the original purpose of marriage. So my marriage isn't necessarily about companionship. Sure, it is, you know, that marriage does fulfill that need for companionship. But our primary purpose in marriage is doing God's will. I'm to help my wife do God's will and she's to help me do God's will. So God didn't create a companion for Adam. God created a helper. And so what we see in the beginning is we see Adam in the garden. 
And the work was difficult. So God created a helper for him. And then this is what God says in verse 24. The narrator of Genesis, Moses picks up, the Holy Spirit picks up, and he says, Therefore, man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. So marriage is also this union, right? This union where two selfish people become one. They become united in will. They become united in purpose. And what was the purpose of Adam and Eve's marriage? Again, it was to do God's will. It was to rule righteously for God. Well, if we were to stop the story there, right there, we could say, oh, this is a pretty good story. We could say, oh, Adam and Eve, they had a pretty successful marriage. They did God's will. They have a bright future ahead of them. But as we know, the story, the story does not end there, does it? The story continues. And so we get to Genesis chapter 3, and what happens? Adam and Eve, they break the world. Instead of ruling righteously for God, instead, instead of fulfilling their purpose, the purpose of their marriage, they listen to the serpent instead. They listen to the serpent instead of listening to God. And so they break the world. So this marriage that was supposed to bring blessing to the world doesn't do that. Instead, the world is cursed. And if the story were to end here, we would say, well, this is a horrible story. It ends with such negativity. But the story continues, doesn't it? Yes, the world has fallen because of Adam and Eve's sin, but there's hope, isn't there? That's what we see in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, God is talking to the serpent and he makes a promise. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So even though the world was broken, even though the world was fallen in the beginning, there is hope. Someone is coming. Someone is coming who's going to be more righteous than Adam and Eve. Someone is coming who, who will do what, what Eve and Adam should have done. Someone is coming who will do what the first bridegroom, Adam, should have done. Adam should have crushed the head of the serpent. And God says, there's someone coming who's more righteous than the first bridegroom. There's someone coming who would crush the head of the serpent. And later, and we see this person later on in scripture when we get to the New Testament. This person is Jesus, but he's also called the bridegroom. And that's sort of where we're going to end uh, this morning. But for now, we move forward in the story. So we move forward from the original bride. And we've moved forward in the story to Israel. Israel, the beloved bride. After the first marriage failed to uh, accomplish God's purposes, God has been working. He started working on this second marriage. And the second marriage is between him, between God and Israel. So what does God do? He calls a man, Genesis chapter 12. He calls a man named Abraham and his wife as well, Sarah. And he makes promises to Abraham. You know the promise. And one of the promises is there's going to be a great nation that comes from you. This great nation is actually going to come from your son, Isaac. And so what does God do for Isaac? God finds a son for Isaac. And we see the story in Genesis chapter 24. We're not going to read that, but the story of God finding a, a, a bride, excuse me, for Isaac, not a son for Isaac, but the story of God finding a bride for Isaac is in Genesis 24. Uh, in that story, Abraham's servant goes out to find a bride. And so Abraham's servant stops at this well. And at this well, uh, Abraham's servant prays to God and he says, send me the bride that you want for Isaac. And that's exactly what God does. Rebecca appears at this well. And so God prepares a bride for Isaac at this well. And then we move forward in the story. We move forward in the story from Jacob or from Isaac, excuse me, to Jacob. And Jacob in Genesis chapter 29 also finds a bride. And can you guess where Jacob was whenever he first sees Rachel? He's at a well. He's also at a well. And so we move forward in the story again. We move, move forward to another patriarch named Moses. And Moses, whenever he's running from Egypt, he stops at a well. And can you guess who he meets? His bride. He meets his wife. So uh, this theme of brides and wells sort of have a, have a, a appear, at least, in the book early on in the book of Genesis. And, that, and that's what we see with these early mar marriages. But these early marriages, 
aren't the most important marriage in scripture. The most important marriage in scripture is the marriage, and the most prominent marriage in, in, in the Old Testament scripture is the marriage between God and his bride, Israel. And we see that throughout the, the Old Testament. Isaiah speaks and he says, for, for your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. So God says, I'm your husband. He's talking to Israel. I'm your husband. You are my bride. So God brings his bride, brings Israel out of captivity, and he prepares her in the wilderness. And then he brings her home. He brings her home uh, to, to the land of Canaan. And while they're in the wilderness, the Israelites become hungry. And so God feeds, feeds them bread out of heaven. And the Israelites become thirsty. And so God creates a well in the desert and provides water from the rock. And why does God do all of this? It's because he loves Israel. It's because he loves Israel. In Deuteronomy chapter seven, God explains why he chose to save Israel. And you guys don't have to turn there. I'm just gonna go through some of these scriptures quickly. Deuteronomy seven, you can just listen. It was not because you were more in number than any other nations that the Lord has set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all people, but it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out of slavery. So God tells the people, look, I chose you and it wasn't because you were all great. It wasn't because you were like the next best thing. It wasn't because you were wealthy or powerful or had all of this status. He says, I chose you to be my bride because I love you. That's why, because I love you. But the question is, did Israel love God the way that he loved them. And so that brings us to the next stop in our journey through scripture. As we move forward in scripture, we see, yes, Israel is the beloved bride, but they also become the ruined bride. They also become the unfaithful bride. God loved them. God blessed them. But what did Israel continue to do? He, they, con he, they continued to cheat on God. You know, God essentially, he said, look, I just want you to serve me. I want you to serve me and only me and don't serve any other gods. And Israel said, meh. I think I'm going to do what I want. See, Israel was an unfaithful bride. And we see that in Hosea. Uh, that's our scripture reading. or our, 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 That's the, the book, the minor prophet that we're in, in in our scripture reading at this time. We see it in the book of Hosea. In the book of Hosea, chapter 1 and verse 1, God says to Hosea, go and have a, have a woman of, of harlotry and marry this woman. Why? Because Israel, because the land commits harlotry against me. The land is unfaithful to me. So even though God is good to Israel, even though God loves Israel, they cheat on him. They continue to be unfaithful. So the question sort of pops up into our minds. Is there any hope for this ruined bride? I mean, put yourself in that situation. If your spouse was unfaithful, how would you feel? That's how God feels. So is there any hope for this ruined bride? Well, the answer to that is yes. Yes, there is. Because God loves his bride. And we see that in Hosea chapter 3 when, Ho when God tells Hosea, that woman who was unfaithful to you, that woman who left you, go and find her and see if she will come back. And the idea is that when Israel is ready to return, I will be ready to accept her back. That's the idea. And so we see in Isaiah chapter 62, again, you don't have to turn there, just listen. We see in Isaiah chapter 62, God says, you, he's talking to Israel, you shall no more be termed forsaken because you were forsaken. And your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, my delight is in her. And your land shall be called married for the Lord delights in you and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. So God tells us there is hope. There is hope. Even though the beloved bride became the, the ruined bride, the broken bride, the unfaithful bride, there is hope. God says you're going to be married once again. You're going to be restored. You're going to be the faithful bride once again. But the question is, who is the man who would accept this broken and unfaithful woman? I mean, put yourself in that situation. Would you accept an, a, a, a spouse who you knew to be uh, frequently unfaithful? 
So who is the man who will accept this unfaithful woman? And so we move forward in our story again to the New Testament and we're introduced to the bridegroom. We're introduced to the bridegroom who would accept this broken and unfaithful woman. And as we see in the New Testament, the bridegroom is Jesus. We see it in the Gospel of John. Go ahead and turn there. I want to spend some time in the Gospel of John. One of the things that John wants us to see, and we see it in the Gospel of John, and we see it in the the other books that John wrote as well, the book of Revelation. But one of the things that John wants us to see is that Jesus is the bridegroom. And so it starts, it begins in John chapter 2, where, John, where, where Jesus, uh, he, he, he does his first miracle. And I think that's significant. I think John tells us that for a reason. He wants us to really study this miracle. And the miracle is he's at this wedding and there's a problem. And what's the problem? You remember the story? There's no wine at this wedding. And if you know anything about the, the ancient uh, cultures, it was the bridegroom's responsibility to provide wine for the ceremony. And so what we see is that this bridegroom failed. He failed to provide the wine. So Jesus, what does he do? He turns water into wine. And I think John is trying to show us that Jesus is the true and faithful bridegroom. If you're not convinced on that just yet, let's move forward to John chapter three because it becomes clearer. John chapter three, we're gonna pick up in verse 25. In the context John's disciples are kind of complaining about Jesus. Jesus is still in all of our disciples. And so John the Baptist, is, uh, he, he addresses that complaint. Let's pick up in verse 26, actually. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing and all are going to him. John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ but I have been sent before him. Verse 29 is important. But the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So in this context, who is the friend of the bridegroom? John the Baptist is, and who's the bridegroom? Jesus. So again, John, uh, the, the, the author of this gospel, John the apostle, he wants us to see that Jesus is the bridegroom, the true and faithful bridegroom. And this uh, becomes even clearer whenever you move into chapter four. John chapter four. We're gonna pick up in verse one. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciple, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. So Jesus is, is traveling through. Uh, Samaria, and he stops at this well, at Jacob's well. And that sort of brings our mind back to all of those Old Testament characters that we talked about earlier. W- what happened at the well? All of these, all of these men, Isaac, uh, Jacob, Moses, their bride was met at this well. And so that's sort of going on in our mind. Jacob met his bride at this well, and now Jesus is stopped at this well uh, as, as well, I guess you could say. And then what happens? Verse seven, a woman from Samaria came to draw water and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And so we see something familiar again. Uh Uh-oh, now there's a woman at this well with Jesus. What's going to happen? But the thing about this woman is that this woman is is really an unfaithful woman. She's a broken woman with with many failed marriages and she's sleeping with someone who's, who's currently not her husband. She's an, uh, an unfaithful, uh, disloyal husband. As a matter of fact, we see that in verse 16, uh, verse 16 of John chapter 4. And, and it, this becomes clear when we realize that the Greek word for husband is also the Greek word for man. And so we kind of have to use context to determine what it's talking about. Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands and the one you have now, the man you have now, is not your husband. What you have said is true. So this is a a really an an unfaithful woman. The the man who she's currently sleeping with is not her husband. Really, she's not marriage material. 
Uh, most guys would say, would say that this woman is not married material. So we ask the question that we asked at the end of, the, of, this, of this last point, the ruined bride. We ask the same question. Who is the man who will accept this broken and unfaithful woman? And the answer to that question is the true and faithful bridegroom. The answer to that question is Jesus. In verse 13, moving, moving up a little bit, Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again because the water that I will give him be, will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So God, or Jesus says, I can give you living water. And Jesus isn't just offering her water. What Jesus is really offering her is himself because he is the living waters. He is the bread of life. So this woman that few men would ever accept to be a bride, Jesus says, I'm offering myself to you. In the same way that, 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 that Isaac found a wife at a well, or his wife was found at a well, Jacob found a wife at a well, uh, and Moses found a wife at a well, Jesus here, in a symbolic sense, finds a wife at a well. Not literally, so don't lose me on that. But in a symbolic sense, he finds a wife at a well. And, and here's the point of this. The point of this is that Jesus is, is, is ready to accept broken people like Reuben and like you. He's ready to accept you into a, a marriage, into a, into a relationship. Do you see that? Good. I'm just making sure you're still with me. Jesus is ready to accept broken people like me and you into a marriage. And so Jesus' relationship uh, with the church really is, is the fulfillment of marriage. And someone might say, is it really? Do you think Genesis, when God instituted marriage, do you think that's really pointing to Christ in the church? It absolutely is. It absolutely, turn to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter five, please. Ephesians chapter five, uh, because Paul says that exact thing. Paul looks at marriage uh, and he looks at marriage as it's instituted in the beginning. And he says, this is about Christ in the church. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, picking up in verse 31, Paul quotes from Genesis chapter 2. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And then he calls it a mystery, but he, he, he uh, un unveils, he reveals the mystery for us. He explains the mystery. And he says, I am saying that it, that marriage, that it refers to Christ in the church. So Paul is looking back to when God institutes marriage and he says, this refers to Christ and the church. So again, the idea is that Jesus is, is the bridegroom who is willing and ready to accept anyone who will be loyal to him, even if they have this horrible, broken, unfaithful past. That's the true bridegroom. But we've got one more stop in our story We've got one more stop in our story now, and this is the final bridegroom, the, or the final bride, excuse me, uh, the beautiful bride, and that is the church. And we see this idea throughout scripture, like I said, we see it in Ephesians, but I, I want us to go to Revelation to, to end out this section of the lesson. Revelation chapter 21, and this section of Revelation, in some sense, is talking about the church now. But in another sense, it's talking about the church in eternity. We talked about this idea of something being already and something being not yet. In some sense, it's already, but in another sense, it's not yet quite here. And that's what we see in Revelation chapter 21. Picking up in verse 1, it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, that's us. That is the church, the holy city, New Jerusalem. I mean, that's the church, you know, whether it's the church today or the church in heaven, I'm not gonna debate that, but it's the church. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So just like God brought a bride to the first Adam, God brings a bride to Jesus, who is also called the second Adam. God brings a bride to Jesus as well. And the wedding day is coming, by the way. The wedding day is when Jesus returns. And when Jesus returns, when Christ returns, he and the bride will be married and they will dwell for forever in eternity. You could call this sort of the world's longest engagement. 
I suppose. You know, people talk about how Ruth and I dated for a long time, but I mean, it's been 2,000 years that we've been engaged and we're still waiting for the wedding. So I guess you could call this the world's longest engagement. But that's, that's how the story goes. That's the story. That's the love story in the Bible. Love story began with a fallen bridegroom, the original bridegroom who failed to crush the head. And so God plans to create another bride who eventually fell. And then the good and faithful bridegroom who will be the leader of the church, the bride. That's the story of marriage throughout scripture. And what's the point of this? What's the point of this? I said earlier that this, the point of this is to teach us that our marriage is pointing to something. What is our marriage pointing to? Our marriage, my marriage with my wife, your marriage with your wife or your husband, whatever. Your marriage is pointing to the final marriage in eternity where Christ and the church will be united to live forever. That's what our marriage is pointing to. So let's talk a little bit about application. What can we take home from all of this? First of all, uh, God is calling broken people. That's number one. God is calling broken people. You know, sometimes we get this idea in our head that no, we're, we're too lost. We're too broken. God doesn't want anything to do with me because I've made too many mistakes. Have you read the book of Hosea? If you read the book of Hosea, you realize how ridiculous that is. We all are un unfaithful people. We all are the unfaithful bride. God is ready to accept us as long as we are willing to obey him. We see that in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 5, the people, why are you eating? Jesus, why are you eating with these people? Because I've not come to call, I've not come to call the, the, the healthy. I've come to call the unhealthy. I've come to call those who know they need a physician. So God is calling broken people. That's the first point of application. The second point is we must love God and one another the way that he loves us. Do you see that in this story that God loves us? Uh, what happened to the original bride and groom? Did they succeed or did they fail in their goal? They failed. What happened to the beloved bride? Succeed or failed? Okay, so over and over again, mankind continues to fail. And what does God continue to try to do to bring us to him and to enter into a relationship with him? God loves us. And he doesn't love us because, again, because we're the wealthiest people, we're the greatest people. He loves us because he loves us. And because he, is, he has a promise. So do we love God that way? Are our lives centered and devoted around God or are our lives centered and devoted around self? You know, sometimes we wonder about if we should do this thing or should I, should I study this book or, or should I go to church at this time or should I go to this singing? Oh, no, I don't really feel like doing that. And we make, we make uh, serving God all about me. I, you know, I don't like, I don't like Lamentations. So I'm just not going to read that book. It's all about me and what I want. It's not about me and what I, it's all about serving the Lord because we love him. We love him. And as, as, a, as a part of that, we love one another as well. Because if we are the bride of Christ, then we're all what? One big family is what we, is what we are. So we love one another. So that's the second point of application. We must love God the way that he loves us. And the third is something better is coming. You know, sometimes we look around at this broken world and all of the atrocities that go on, like, you know, the, the Belarus thing. I'm sure some of y'all heard that on the news. And we look, oh, look at how wicked that dictator is. And, and we wonder, is this it? Is this all there is to life? Or maybe we don't even look that far. You know, Belarus, I don't know, that's what, 4,000 miles away? Maybe we look right here in our, own, in our own area and we look at our relationships and we look at the broken relationships in our lives or maybe even the broken marriages in our lives and we wonder to ourselves well is this it is this all that life has to offer I can I offer you a word of encouragement something better is coming so if you're in that broken relationship there's a better relationship coming or if you're in that broken marriage where where your husband or your wife isn't doing God's will or maybe both and you're wondering is this it there's a better marriage coming with the true and faithful bridegroom. So something better is coming. So those are the three points of application. And there are plenty more that we could take from this lesson. But, but those are three to get you started. God is calling to broken people. We must love God the way that he loves us. And something better is coming. And what is that something better that's coming? It's the wedding day. The wedding day is coming. And the question is, are you ready for that wedding day? That's the question. You know, in the book of Matthew, Jesus, he, he, he teaches this parable. 
parable of the bridegroom and the foolish and wise virgins. And the foolish virgins, they're not ready for the wedding day. And so they go out to buy oil. And this is what the text says. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast. And the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Are we ready for the wedding that is coming? Because if we're not ready and the door is shut, then that, that's it. Truly, truly, I do not know you. Are you ready? Maybe there's someone here this morning who realizes they are not ready for that day. Maybe there's someone here this morning who realizes they are not ready for their wedding day and they need to be by, by pledging allegiance to Jesus, by being baptized into his death so that on that last day, you could be a part of the wedding between the lamb and his bride. If that's you, we encourage you to come forward. Or maybe you've left the Lord and you're not ready and you want to come back to him. If you need to respond to the invitation, you can come now as we stand and as we sing.